Now, in the story, uh, a message is about accepting God's second best. It's accepting God's, uh, maybe not perfect will, but his good or acceptable will. And here we find in the story, Jacob, if we go back as you're looking over the passage, verses 1 through 5, we're, we remind you the story of Jacob, how he had left his father and his mother and went to the land of uh, where Laban the Syrian was. And he went to find him a wife. And God sent him through Bethel and how he spoke with God and had a vision and laid his head upon the stones there. And he went out to Bethel and he went out from there and he went to the land of Padanaram and he, he got uh, a wife. He got more than he planned on actually. He got more than he, he, <laughs> he got four wives. And so uh, it's hard enough to just get along with one wife, amen. Uh, this guy had uh, a lot more than he bargained for. And he got Rachel, but he got Leah, and he got Bilhah, and, and uh, what was the other one? Zilpha. And, uh, and then they all started arguing about who gets him, and they started having bargains. And one got some mandrakes from her son, and she bought him. And he was kind of like a, a, just a, piece, of, uh, of, you know, a piece of meat after a while, just a, part, just a, a slave, you know, <laughs> who, who gets me tonight, you know. And so, so uh, you ladies talk about just being, uh, what do you call that, just uh, merchandise. Here's poor Jacob, man, and his wife's fighting over who gets me tonight. And uh, he just couldn't, you know, he had 12 kids and a daughter. And uh, it just, all that time, he didn't have any fellowship with God. You study that passage, is there, uh, 20 years went by. 20 years went by, and he, and he had trouble with Laban. He changed his wages 10 times. And God still prospered him. And God can prosper you as a Christian and still look out for you, but it's not God's perfect will sometimes if you get away from Bethel. And here he got away from Bethel, the house of God. Here he got away from God for some time and enriched himself in this world. And it just seemed like it wasn't the best years of his life. And so here he finally fled from that place to get back to Bethel. Here you find him running in the middle of the night. And along the way, I think we're going to see from this passage, and looking back over the story, he lost a few things. And you can lose a few things and not even realize it, like Samson, when he didn't even realize that the, he wist not that the Lord had departed from him. And when you get around the world and you warm yourself the world's fires, you can actually lose some things and not even know how far you've gotten away from Bethel at times. The things of the world start to encroach and creep in your life. And you start to get comfortable with things of the world. And the people and the sons of Laban and Laban himself, the Syrian. And the Jew doesn't normally get along with the Syrian. And Laban was the Syrian. And here he was, you know, feeling comfortable there in that land. When that was not the land that God said to Abraham, I will show thee a promised land, a place where you can, where I will build a city. And so you read the story, and here he was, running for his life now with his four wives and his children, middle of the night, sneaking away like a banshee <laughs> in the night, and his wife taking the gods and hiding them in the camel's furniture. And here they were, running back to Bethel. Amen, that's a good scene, though, in a way. Uh, sometimes it's just good to finally wake up and say, what am I doing here in the land of the Syrians? I need to get back to God. And so we read in chapter 35, God speaks to Jacob. And God said unto Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel, and dwell there, and make there an altar unto God that appearest unto thee, when thou fleddest from the face of Esau thy brother twenty years ago. Then Jacob said unto his household and all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you, and be clean, and change your garments. And let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make there an altar unto God who answered me in the day of my distress and was with me in the way which I went. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hand and all their earrings which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the oak which, by, which was by Shechem. And they journeyed, and the terror of, the, of God was upon the cities that were round about them, and they did not pursue after the sons of Jacob. And so Jacob is a picture of a Christian who gets out of the will of God for a while. And Christian, there's going to be times where you might not get backslidden, but you just get a little sideways with the Lord. <laughs> there's going to be times where you just don't realize it. You get entrenched with the cares of life and the business of this life. And, 
and you forget to pray, and you forget to have fellowship with God, and you're, you're saved, and you're, you're not living in deep, gross sin, but you just don't have that time you had when you used to be in dwelling in Bethel. And the, the Jews of, of today are like that. The Jews for 2,000 years have been wandering from their God. They've gotten away from the house of God. They've gotten away from the God of their forefathers. And Jacob's a picture of the wandering Jew. Picture of a Jew in fellowship with the Syrian, Laban. And out of God's will. Christian, uh, don't, you don't want to live like Jacob did. You might gather a lot of things in this life and get a lot of children and get a lot of money and a lot of cattle. But all that doesn't compare to having that fellowship he had that night when he was in Bethel. He said, I got to get back to that. Amen. You might have a big family and have cars and things, but nothing. Brother, nothing compares to that sweetness you had when you walked with God. And if you have it right now, I'm not saying everybody here is back with but don't lose that closeness with Jesus Christ. Jacob lost it. He lost some things. Paul, five times God warned him, don't go up to Jerusalem. I don't, it doesn't matter if you're the mighty Paul. He went against the Holy Spirit. And you know, he lost some things as a result. He lost his liberty. The rest of the time he was under the care of the Roman power. And taken to jail and put up in prison up in Rome. And he had his own hired house but he never was at liberty again. He never had the freedom to go out and preach and trailblaze like he did all through Greece and Turkey and all that region of Macedonia. Paul lost something when he went against the Lord and went the wrong direction and went east. He shouldn't have went to Jerusalem. Five times, the Holy Spirit, don't go up, don't go up, don't go up, don't go up, don't go up. Christians are persistent to disobey God. The Jew is out of God's will. Jacob was, a Gentile, was in a Gentile territory. And, uh, I mean, that's why the Gentiles, I mean, when the, when the Jews left America and left Europe, they took a lot of money with them. <laughs> he took a lot of stuff from Laban. And the, you know what? The Gentiles love money. Amen. And that's why they envied the Jew. Because the Jew got a lot of money. And they took a lot of money out of America, a lot of Europe, and went down there to Israel. And a lot of Gentiles hate the Jews. Amen. You watch out. Watch your heart. Because there's, uh, there's a lot of reasons why you can hate the Jew. Laban had a lot of an anger there. He was chasing after Jacob. He wanted to kill Jacob. He said, why'd you steal my daughters? Why'd you take out, out, run out in the middle of the night? You read that chapter back there. He was going to do him harm until God spake to him in the night and spoke to him in a vision and said, don't do any harm to Jacob. Christian, you ought to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Uh, Laban, how much money the Jews took. That's why the Gentiles envy the Jew. They know how to make money, and the Gentiles love money. Now, there's a, a permissive will of God, and there's the directive will of God for the Christian. God will permit a lot of things in your life. God will permit you to go someplace, but it may not be the directive will of God. Jacob was in the permissive will of God for 20 years. But finally, God's directive will got the, the upper hand. Christian, you ought to be sensitive and say, God, what is your directive will for my life? Where would you have me to go? Lord, I want to know what you want, not what I want to do. But Lord, show me the way that you would have me to go. But Paul besought them. He said, I beseech you by the mercies of God uh, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. I hope I quote that right, but I make mistakes from time to time. But he says... Uh, what does he say about the will of God in the next verse? Bob, do you remember in the, in the next? I know, I threw you off. Uh, may, may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so Christians, you can get God to say, that's good, I'll let you do that. I'll accept that. But then it says, what is the perfect will of God? I want something more than God will just accept it because I'm his child and he loves his children. I want to know what God's perfect will for my life is. Don't you? Don't you this morning want to, God, what is your perfect will for me to do? And he worked for Laban the Syrian and that was a bad combination. He worked for 20 years and Laban stole from him every time. He said, you changed my wages 10 times. And so the first thing he lost, he lost the place of blessing. He lost the place of blessing. Bethel is called the house of God. A lot of Christians have lost their place of blessing. They don't see the importance of being with God and being in the house of God. You're here this morning, uh, uh, I'll preach at you, but it'll prick your heart. 
The Word of God will, will challenge you and say, am I in God's perfect will this morning? I want to be in the place of God. I want to be in church on Sunday morning and say, Lord, speak to my heart. Christian, you ought to stay in the place of God's blessing. That's where God wants you at. I don't, I don't know where that's at, but God knows where it's at, and you ought to know where that's at. So, Lord, I'm going to be in the place like Bethel where you blessed me and you opened my understanding. I saw the angels of God descending and ascending on the ladder and the stairs going to heaven. Lord, I want to see that like Jacob's ladder. Christian, you ought to stay in the place of God's blessing and communion, fellowshipping with him and living in the will of God. Many get out of God's will. They get out for the wrong motives. Wife, a job, money, family, kids, sports. The wrong motives. There's all kinds of things that get you sidetracked. Elijah, uh, he was out there, remember, in the, living by the brook, Chinneroth, and the ravens were feeding him, and he came back to rebuke Ahab, and along the way, he meets Obadiah. Obadiah was there living with Ahab the whole time. And he made a good, a good excuse. He said, well, I, I fed the 50 men of God. The prophets hid them in a cave, 50 there, and I hid another 50. And he was just looking for a justification. And Christian, you can find a justification for living in the world. There's plenty of those things out there. But are you living in Bethel? Are you living in the will of God? Are you fellowshipping with God? This country is filled with millionaires who would love to control every preacher. <laughs> They'd love to tell you how they want to control you and what, 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 what you preach on. They're looking for a preacher that can control and say, be a look, good little boy. Don't preach against sin. Don't preach against, uh, don't bring out that King James Bible. Amen. We're probably never going to have no millionaires around here. They like to run people. Amen. You know, God's people mostly are made up of poor people that do the work of God. Amen. Those are the ones that put their back to the harness and put their back to the, the, their neck to the yoke. And they say, we won't be told what to do. We won't bow down to the world. We're going to bow down to Jesus Christ. Elijah didn't bow down. Obadiah did. He compromised. A lot of, a lot of that. This country's filled with it. Jewish, the Jewish Bible ends with the second book of Chronicles. You know what it says? Go up to Jerusalem. Get back to Jerusalem. Get back to Jerusalem. Ours ends with uh, a curse over in Malachi. We have a different order in the, Gen in the King James Bible. But that Jewish Bible ends in 2 Chronicles chapter 36 and verse 23. It says, go back, go up. You know what the Jew is? He's a wandering Jew. They all, for 2,000 years, they've been running from God. You know what God's doing? He's bringing them back into their land these last days. You're, you're seeing things unfold in our times, folks. It's amazing. Don't fall asleep now. <laughs> Amen. It's a time to get excited. It's a time to say, we're living in the last days. And the Jews are returning to Bethel. They're returning to the house of God. They've been out there in the land of the Gentiles for 2,000 years. And God had to beat them and change their wages and cause them to go through trials and suffering over there. They, but they lost some things. They lost the place of blessing. You know what? We as Gentiles got to enter into their blessings. You read Romans chapter 11 there. It says that the branches were cut off and we were grafted in. Amen. That's the truth. You know why you're saved this morning? Because the, Gent the Gentiles are saved today. Because that Jew ignored his benefit. Ignored his blessing. And said, I don't want the place of blessing. And somebody else got to enter in. That is you. Don't get away from the Lord. You got saved? Stay close to him. Don't get a hardened heart. Secondly... They picked up idols. Look at, look at our text here, Genesis 35. And God said unto Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel. He left that place. Verse 2, And Jacob said unto his household and all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you, and be clean, and change your garments. Well, you, your heart gets affected. Your, a lot of the outward things get dirty too. <laughs> he said, I want you to change your clothes. There's some things that start looking outwardly bad. Idols in the heart start to affect the outward appearance. Amen. You know, what we're saying here is, it's either like back to Bethel or back to Babylon. Amen. Back to the Bible or back to the jungle, the old timers used to say. And we're seeing America at a, at a place of the crossroads where you've got to make a choice. Do I want to go back to God and Bethel? Or do I want to go the way of the jungle and go the way of the world? And your kids and your family are being pulled to look like the world and dress like the world. And your garments look like the world. Amen. 
The Lord said something about their garments was offensive, unclean, got defiled. Why? The idols of the heart. There were idols in that family. It says right there, he says, and change your garments. He said, what? put away the strange gods. You remember what happened when they left out of there? Uh, Rachel hid the, her father's gods and took them with her. Why'd she do that? Something wrong in that family. Something was wrong with Jacob and his own wife. She was trusting in those false gods. She thought those things, those talismans, those things can help us. And you know where the idols show up? Mostly in your family. They're called the family idols. That's what I call them. You bring things over from the old life, from your parents, and from your forefathers and your relatives, and you want to bring them with you on the way to serving God. You got to look and say, is there some idols that I brought with me into my Christian life? Are there some idols, are there some gods in my heart that I worship secretly? I hide them in, in the camel's furniture, and, I, and they're hidden there, and I keep them around because it makes you have a good feeling. I, I like that. It gives me that... Who knows what that demon might be? There's all kinds of demons that come in your life that's an idol that has control over you and make you feel comfortable and make you feel good about yourself. And that thing's just deceiving you. Amen. There's plenty of drugs out there. There's plenty of alcohol out there. There's plenty of clubs out there. There's plenty of things that can take the place of God in Bethel. There's plenty of idols out there. And Jacob said, let's put away the strange gods from us. And on, if we're going to go up there and worship God in Bethel, let's not take any of these false gods with us. And if you're going to worship God, you've got to look in your heart and say, are there some idols in my heart? Are there some idols in my home? Are there some things that I worship and put before God in my life? The, the television can become a God, an idol to you. Social media can become more important to you than God. Some books you read and some games you play can become more important to you than your Savior and being in the place of Bethel. Amen. There's plenty of idols out there. I'm beating up on my idols as well as your idols, amen? Those idols creep in and they're small, a little, little figurine, a little thing they put under the, in the furniture there and hold on to. As Catholics, we know what they were. We used to have little crosses and little statues and little uh, talismans and things to pray to, little pictures. Uh, no, we're talking about different ones in the Christian's life. They're di more difficult to root out. They're things that come into your heart and into your mind. Things that deceive you. The Bible says, the Lord said, put away the strange gods. Family idols, a place of compromise. The Bible says, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother. His wife was there too long with Laban. Too long in the land of Syria. And if you as a parent, if you as a father, a husband, don't lead your family and just let the world take your family, shame on you. You have to fight for your family. Jacob was there 20 years and she picked up all those idols while she was there and fell in love with them enough to take them with her. Amen. You need to be vigilant. You need to be jealous over your own. And finally, Jacob got his heart right here in chapter 35 and said, put away the strange gods that are among you and be clean and wash yourselves. Get a washing in the word of God. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and the twain shall be one flesh. There's something about a marriage. God put you men in charge. We need men to step up and lead their families. Amen. I'm preaching to you men. Because there's a lack of manhood in America. That's the problem mostly in America. It's not women. It's a lack of men. No wonder we have a feminine spirit running rampant in our nation. Amen, amen, amen. We need some men that will stand up like Jacob and lead. You don't see Rachel and Leah leading. Jacob took lead. God put men under that responsibility, that yoke, and said, lead your family. Be the head of the wife and be submitted to Christ. Jacob finally got some idols out of the home. I'm preaching to Ed Keogh this morning. I got idols creeping in the back door, in the front door, through the window, in the for camel's furniture. <laughs> I don't even know what that is, but I, I'm going to look in my camel's furniture when I get home today. Yes. Might be a piggy. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Some of you are like, amen, preacher. <laughs> so there's things in your home. There's some sin in your house. There's some idols that creep in your heart. There's some things that you need to kick out and say, just wash yourself. Be clean. Verse 2. And Jacob said unto all his household and all that were with them, put away the strange gods that are among you and be clean and change your garments. I mean, you can't follow every whim. You've got to follow the Lord. One Scottish woman I, uh, 
I heard about an old tale. She'd go uh, selling buttons and thread and yarn to house to house in the villages. And she would uh, throw a, when she'd come to a crossroad, an uncertain crossroad, which way the village was lied, she didn't know, she would take a stick and throw it in the air. And whichever is like spin the bottle, whichever way the stick fell, she'd fall that end of that stick that was peeled, and she'd go down that road. And one time they saw her, she kept throwing the stick in the air, and picking it up, throwing it in the air. And so she said, what are you doing? She said, well, it keeps sending me down that road, and I don't want to go down that road. That one there is smoother. And that's how we are as Christians sometimes. <laughs> we just keep on, Lord said, go down that way. No, Lord, I don't want to go that way. I want to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to keep on. It's the Lord's will I go that way. You got to beware of those spirits that come in your heart where you don't go back to Bethel. You don't go back to that humble place where you know that I will meet with the Lord there in humility and prayer and get back to a quiet place where I know God is leading me. We force our way. The Bible says try the spirits, whether they are of God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. Christian, you need to be able to try the spirits in these last days and say, is that of God? There's a lot of people going to come at you about your King James Bible and test you and see whether you truly believe the Word of God. There's going to be some people about, come to you about your holy walk with God and test you and try you. There are going to be demons coming at you and false prophets, Christian. You better know this book and walk with your God and put away some of them strange gods in your life. Amen. Thirdly, I'd say he lost his testimony and power. He lost his testimony. You go back to Genesis chapter 31, verse 27. Well, let's go to 25. And Laban overtook Jacob. And now Jacob had pitched his tent in the mountain. Laban with his brethren pitched in the mount of Gilead. And Laban said to Jacob, What hast thou done that thou hast stolen away unawares to me and carried away my daughters as captives taken with the sword? Wherefore didst thou flee away secretly and steal away from me? And didst not tell me that I might have sent thee away with mirth and with song and with tabret and with harp? And hast not suffered me to kiss my sons and my daughters? Thou hast now done foolishly in so doing. That is a strange thing, isn't it? I mean, you just leave without telling the in-laws. I know some of you would like to do that. You'd like to get away. But he was, he was running in fear. When you look back at the stories of how, uh, you know, Isaac got a wife and how Jacob got his wife, rather different stories, wouldn't you say? Here, Abraham sends Eliezer out, and Isaac didn't go anywhere. He's sitting there in his tent meditating in the eventide. His mother had passed away, and uh, he's sitting there, and he was sorrowful, but the Lord was comforting him, and Abraham sent off a, a servant, and that servant prayed, and along comes a woman to water not only him to give him water but watered the, whole, the camels and all of his servants and he asked her her name and who she was and she said I'm uh, the daughter of Bethuel the sister of Laban and here she was uh, Ray, uh, Rachel a good name a young woman that has a, uh, a testimony and what did that Rachel do amen I see you back there smiling and uh, Justin's got him a Rachel. Amen. And the Lord brought her to him. You know what the thing with Isaac uh, was? He waited on God. And God supplied like Boaz his need. He brought the woman to him. He brought and supplied his need when he was in business serving the Lord. And here he was just waiting on God. And Eliezer says, will you go with me? And he, she, she had to make a choice. And Laban was there trying to persuade well, give her time, let her stay here. And if he could have got a, a day, you know he'd get a week. And if he'd get a week, you know he'd get a month. That's how the devil works. Did you ever notice that? Let her think about it for a few days. And, he said, and that servant said, no, she got to make up her mind right now. She going with me or not? Amen. The Lord does that sometimes. He said, no, don't give the devil any place. Give no place to the devil. Don't let him have a, an hour or maybe a day. He'll stow more time, say, go ahead, and you know what? 20 years will go by. And that's what happened to Jacob. But here was Isaac. He got that wife, and here she comes up to him. And she was a smoker, but she quit. Because it said when she saw Isaac, she lit off her camel. And she came to him. <laughs> See, that's, a, that's heavy smoking there. My grandpa smoked camels, no filters. 
He said, kill you. Doctors say camels are the best. <laughs> yeah, back in the 50s, they had kids smoking cigarettes and Barney Rubble and Fred drinking beer in the back, you know, Schlitz. You know, you read all, you ever see those commercials? You know, beer's good for your baby. You have a little bit in their bottle every day. You give you cancer. But anyways, as a side note, she quit. Rachel quit. Did you quit? Okay. Rebecca. I say Rachel. Rachel's a good name anyway. I've been thinking about Rachel the whole time because I'm seeing her smile back there. It's Rebecca. She lit off her camel. Rachel never smoked. And you know, it's just a picture. It's a picture of waiting on God in the place of God and serving the Lord. I believe that. Being faithful in your giving. Faithful in your church. Faithful in your place. And good things come to you. Amen. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And here's Jacob, whose name means supplanter, poacher, sneaky. He's sneaky. He thinks he's going to trick his brother and get away with it instead of just trusting the Lord. There we know the story. God led his mother to do that, but he kept on in that vein, and he gets tricked by Laban. Same guy. Laban, the brother who was trying to keep Eliezer from going at the same time, the same day, saying, let her stay and think it over and let us comfort her and let's give it. No, we're going. And she went with this man. Here's Jacob. He ends up going in there and getting tricked. He has to give up seven years of, of slave labor <laughs> to Laban. And then he finds out, he wakes up in the morning and it's not even Rachel. It's Leah. He'd been tricked, hoodwinked. And now he's got to serve 14 years to the both of them. And then he gets into all this other trouble with the, what do they call them? The, the wives maids or handmaids or what do you call them? Concubines? I don't know. What do they call Beth, uh, um, Zilpha and Bilha? Does anybody know the name, what he called them? Their, their handmaids? Oh my goodness. And just headache after headache. And finally he escapes running out of there with no testimony. Scared cat. Running for his life. That's not the way a Christian should live. You know, you, you can sit there and think about all these uh, Christians in the Bible that went that way. Here's Peter, warming his hands by the fireplace, denying he knew the Lord, cursing, swearing, I never knew the man. He backslid. He lost his testimony. When you get out of the place of blessing, you lose your testimony too. You lose the blessing of God and you lose the testimony of the Lord. The testimonies of the Lord are pure gold. That's something that's precious is when you have a testimony and power with God to witness people. And the word of God is on your tongue and you speak to people and it ministers to people. And they remember you gave me the word of God one time and I needed it. And you gave me good counsel. And then the word of God was just coming out of you like... Just naturally, that's where you want to be. That testimony, where the word of God is right in your heart, right in your mind, right on your tongue. The, the, thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. The word of God is precious in your heart. And, as the, and Peter got away from the will of God one night. He got out there warming his hands around the Lord's enemies, cursing and swearing. And nobody would have thought he was a Christian that night. Lost his testimony. Can you imagine what that little maid, if she was out there on the day of Pentecost, and saw Peter standing up there preaching. <laughs> she, I know that guy. He's that same guy. I, I know that. He's a hypocrite. Man, he was cursing and said he didn't know the Lord. Hey, there's some people who might remember back in those days. Amen? You go watch your testimony. Some days somebody come back around and say, wow, well, good to see you serving the Lord. <laughs> didn't I? I mean, all right. Well, praise the Lord. I'll just keep it. I'll just keep that to myself, what I know about you. Yeah. You can get out there in the world so bad, you nobody even know you're a Christian. You don't have any power. You don't have any testimony. You don't have a witness. You don't talk about Jesus Christ. I think about Rex Harrison. He's not the actor. He was a singer. He sang. He, had, he was in a wheelchair, uh, injured. And he'd sing at our church down in Pensacola. And he'd, say he'd give his testimony. He got away from the Lord for many years. He was singing in the, in the clubs and the bars. And when he got right one night, some woman just came up to the bar and put some ten dollar five dollar bill in his cup and said she's just listening to him, can you play this can you play all these sorrowful sad old you know melancholy songs and she said to him i don't know why but something about you just reminds me of a christian 
<laughs> you can't hide it, man. It's in you, and the Holy Spirit's in you, and, and he got, it's pricked his heart, and he said, i got to get right with God. And he went back to the church and got right with God and got on the altar. And he started singing for God. He got back to Bethel. Christian, don't even leave Bethel. Jonah, he got away from God, ran from God, got in the belly of the ship, got down, kept going down to Joppa, down to the sea, down to the ship, down to the bottom of the ship, in the bilge of the ship. He, he can't get no lower than that guy. No, you can. And those guys, they're praying. There's a storm. They're praying to all their gods. And finally, they say, it's this guy here. The lot fell on him, and they threw in Jonah. And he got thrown into the sea. He went down some more. And he got into the belly of the well. He went down into the well. And he went down to hell. The Bible says, out of the belly of hell, cried I. Oh, man, that guy's a saved man right there. He goes down as low as you can go. Picture of Christ. I mean, the Lord says, as Jonah was, so shall the Son of Man be. But man, man alive, what an example. You can run from God so far, you just keep going down, 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 down. And finally, those guys, when they threw him overboard, the storms stopped. And they said, they must have looked at themselves and said, but that guy was a devil. <laughs> got rid of him and everything's going better now. We got, got out of that storm. Christian, you can be the problem in a lot of people's lives if you run away from God. You know, Jacob just had a lot of problems when he got away from God. Just trouble after trouble. He, did, he wasn't a blessing to anybody. He lost his testimony. David lost his testimony. Remember that? He got so far away from the Lord and he lost his wives, his children. He's over there under the Philistines' power. He had to scramble on the gates and dribble down his beard with spittle. And he's like, hey. I said, what are you doing? I'm acting like David. That's how bad he got. That's a sad picture in the Bible, isn't it? David had to act like a madman. Here's the hero. The one they cried out. David hath slain his ten thousands. Is uh, sitting there like a madman having to behave himself like that because he's afraid of the Philistines. And then they're going out to war and they said, it's David. We better not take it. They didn't even trust him. He didn't have anybody. He got away from the Lord. You say, David? Yeah. Paul? Yeah. Peter? Yeah. Anyone can get away from the Lord. Amen. But you know what you do? You say, I want to get back to Bethel. I want to get, I want to get back to the Lord. I want to get my testimony back. I mean, my, when I got saved, uh, there were temptations. And I went out one time, a friend, uh, I was going to buy Lighthouse Baptist Church, and my friend Bronson came by, and he said, hey, why don't you come out with me? Let's go out into the city. And we went to a bar on the south side of the city, and there were train tracks and bad side of town. And he got hooked up with some lady and next thing I turned around looking for him and he left with her and the bar closed huh. I'm out in the middle of the wrong side of the train tracks I don't even have a ride man they're locking the bar you gotta go there's no place for a Christian and the Lord taught me a hard lesson and so I said how am I gonna get home I, it was three in the morning and I started walking on the train tracks I walked at least 15 miles all the way back to the base <laughs> I had to walk over the Coronado Bay Bridge. I had to walk all the way down through what's called um, Coronado. Walked all the way down into the Silver Strand. And I'm all the way just to, what am I doing, man? Out here in the middle of this bridge at 4 and 5 in the morning. Wake, i got to wake up, man. Something's wrong. Bronson isn't my friend. This isn't my friends. The friends are the ones that picked me up and brought me to church. My friends is Keith Karasek. What am I messing around? And I made up my mind. I'm going back to church. I'm going to stay in church. I'm never going back to any bars anymore with Bronson or anybody else. Yeah, did I mess up? I messed up. Everyone in here. But you know what you got to do? I want to get back to Bethel. I want to get back to the altar. I want to get back to God. Look at chapter 35, verse 3. He lost his altar. The Bible says here that God told him, go back to that altar. And God said unto Jacob, arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there and make there an altar unto God. You know what they used to call family devotions back in my day, back in the 70s and 60s? They call it the family altar. How many of you heard that term, the family altar? All right. That's the old timers raised their hand. That was a time when you get around with your family and you would read the word of God and you would pray to God and you would lift up prayers as though you were around the altar of God. We need to get back to the altar too. Jacob lost his altar. All that time, 20 years, you never seen him build an altar. All those years, you don't see him 
communion with God until God finally said, get up and get out of here and go back to Bethel. He lost his altar. He lost the place of blessing. He lost his testimony and power with those that he was living around. And all the while, he had no altar. He had no family devotions. His family was going to pot. Christian, we need to look at ourselves and say, we need to get back to the Bible. We need to get back to Bethel. We as Christians need to go back to the old paths. God didn't forsake them, but there was no altar. For 2,000 years, the Jews haven't had an altar. They're ready to have an altar in Jerusalem, and they're willing to make a deal with death and hell and make a, a deal with the devil in Daniel chapter 9, 27. They're going to make a pact so they can get that altar back, and they're, they, they're so desperate because they have not had an altar. They have not talked to their God. Backslidden Christians, quit praying. You live like that Jew wandering in the wilderness away from God. I don't believe in uh, guardian angels, but I tell you what, God sure had his eye on you and I, amen? I mean, I look back over my life where I got saved. Thank God the Lord uh, spared me many, many times. I was in wrecks and I had all kinds of fights. Woke up in many different places. Just ruining my life with all kinds of bad things. And finally I got saved and I'm sure the Lord kind of breathed a sigh of belief. Said, I'm glad that's over. Amen. <laughs> Got him in finally. Amen. Some were such for some are you. Amen. Raised a lot of hell in this world until God finally kept his eye on you and spared you from many sorrows. But you can go back to those worlds. You can go back. God's not obligated to spare you all the time. De Jacob went back to Bethel, thank God. Back said in Christian, you might not make it back. You're saved and God has a providential eye on you, but... There's a difference between an inheritance and a reward. You're going to get to heaven someday, but you might lose a lot of things. Christian, you can lose a lot of things if you leave Bethel. Jacob, yeah, he gained a lot of earthly things, but he lost a lot of things by, along the way. He lost his altar. The altar represents a place of sacrifice and communion with God, pictures prayer and fellowship with God. You know, the Bible is God's way of talking to you that's it the bible is god's way of talking to you and prayer is your way of talking to god so simple do you talk with god daniel chapter 9 he spends all kinds of time speaking and praying and talking to god making supplication and confession christian do you pray one time we made an altar we were driving through south dakota and I got the harebrained idea to have a family altar. So we pioneered out into the hills of South Dakota. And it takes work. First of all, you've got to find a place. A, a, a place separated. Quiet place. Where no one's going to disturb your time. And then you've got to find rocks. You've got to find a good place with a bunch of rocks. And you've got to gather them rocks, big rocks. It takes a while to build an altar. And you've got to build it. And you've got to take time to balance it all. And make a hole down the middle and it was like a chimney so you could have heat come up and we put we had to gather the wood and what i'm saying is it takes time to pray it takes work to, to to build an altar with god you have to work at being a christian amen no one said it was going to be easy i don't want to go to church on sunday morning my flesh doesn't want either i don't want to pray before i go to bed my flesh nobody's flesh wants to pray before you go to bed amen it's work. It's a work of righteousness. It's a work of faith. You've got to work at being a Christian. And that altar was work, and that altar would take work in your life. But I'll tell you, we, we had to buy a lamb of leg, a leg of lamb. We had to buy a grill. We bought a piece of grill, and we built a fire, got it going, and we stuck the grill on top and put the leg on that, and we cooked it out there, me and my wife and two boys, and prayed over it. And we, we, uh, we made prayers to God. Amen. It was fun. And then we got to eat the lamb together. And that's the fruit of your labor. Christian, it takes work in your Christian life. But to build a family, to go back to Bethel, to stay humble and walk with your God. He hath shown the old man what is good and what the Lord doth require thee, but to do justly and to seek mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. God didn't forsake him, but he left the Lord for many years. Keep searching your Bible. One time an old cobbler was living in England and a, 
And a young theologian came to the curator of the church there. I don't remember what town it was. And he was telling him about this cobbler who knows so much Bible. And the theologian got proud and said, oh, I've studied in Oxford. Let me go meet this cobbler and see how much Bible he really knows. He doesn't know the original languages. He doesn't know the, 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 uh, the Chaldean and the Hebrew. So he goes out and meets this cobbler. And he says, um, what do you know about the, the Urim and the Thummim? He goes, I know that if you change two letters, you get the using and the thumbing. And that's how I know everything I know about the Bible. Using it and thumbing through it. <laughs> you want to know that book? You want to get a hold of God, the Urim and the thumbing? The thumbing? You got the using and the thumbing. You got to start putting your thumb on the pages. And you got to use it as a sword. It ain't going to do you no good just sitting on a shelf. You're not going to have fellowship around the altar of God if you don't get in this book and send up some prayers to God and listen to God as he speaks to you in his word. Christian, get back to the Bible. And lastly, you have to reap what you sow as we close. The trouble with getting out of God's will is the reaping part. You think about all that he, when he got back, he came back to Bethel, his mother died. His mother died while he was away out, of that, out in that Gentile land. Not in his more comforting than a mother. There was a little girl dying one time and they, she was going through chemo and she was feeling real, real, real sick and they wanted to comfort her and they said, and, and they knew she was going to die and she knew she was going to die and she only had a few days to live and they said, oh, when you go to heaven, she goes, what's it going to be like in heaven? She goes, oh, when you go to heaven, it's going to be like the best food you can eat. She goes, oh, I don't like eating food. I have no taste. And they said, oh, it's going to be like the most beautiful music. Oh, but music, oh, it hurts my head. I can't listen to music. And they said, well, it's going to be like being in your mother's arms. She goes, oh, if it's like that, then I want to be in heaven. Amen. There's nothing like a mother's arms. And here was Jacob all those years. His mother was there back in the land of promise. And he lost his mother. Christian, you can lose some things. His daughter Dinah got raped while he was over there. The brothers went out and did some cruel things and murdered some men in their beds while they were circumcised. A lot of terrible things happened to Jacob when he was out of God's will. Things can happen to your children. Things can happen to your relatives. You get out of God's will, you're going to wish you can get back some years and some time. King, you reap what you sow. He came back with a lot of things, but not with the things that he lost. Not as good as the things he lost. One little, well, let's just move on. He had to humble himself before Esau. I mean, you imagine that here, Jacob, God hated Esau, and he had to bow down before Esau. God had to humble him. You might have to be humbled to have to bow down to some people that hate your God and hate you to get right with God and just apologize to some people. Imagine that. You know the story, don't you? And Jacob tried to finagle his way and send his wives in little groups, and he had to bow down and thought he was going to die. I mean, you, you talk about them Jews for 2,000 years. They've been rejecting their Savior, and they don't know any Bible. They lost all the things they had. They're God. I, got, I lived in Bensonhurst, New York, and those Jews walk around with raincoats that shiny and hats with fox furs and curls down their head, and their wives shave their heads off and wear wigs, and they do all that stuff to know God better. And I'll tell you what, these kids in our Sunday school class know the Bible better than any of those rabbi Jews now because they rejected their God, the God of Bethel. Christian, don't go that way. There's a hymn that goes, I walked through the wooden meadows where the sweet thrushes sing and found on a bed of mosses a bird with a broken wing. It sang its old sweet strain, but that bird with the broken pinion never soared as high again. I mean, you get sin in your life, Christian, you're never going to fly and soar as high as you did before. Sin never leaves you the way it found you. Young person, listen. I found a young life broken by sin's seductive art, and touched with a Christ-like pity, I took him to my heart. He lived with a noble purpose and struggled not in vain, but the life that sin had stricken never, but the life that the sin had stricken had never soared as high again. Sin gets in your life, Christian, and you get away from Bethel. It took Jacob down. He, he was hobbled after that. He had to walk on a, a, with a limp. And God had to humble him and break him to get him back to Bethel. Christian, you might have to have a handicap in your life to bring you back to Bethel. You might have to lose some things and see some terrible things happen to get you back to Bethel. 
Jacob finally did business with God and wrestled with the angel and said, Lord, I want your blessing back. What will it take to get some Christians? We need to pray one for another. Amen. Get back to Bethel. There's an old song that goes, Back to the Bible, the true living word, sweetest old so story that ever was heard. Back to the joy life, my soul longs to know. Bethel is calling, and I must go. Back to Bethel, I must go. Back where the rivers of sweet water flow. Back to the true life, my soul longs to know. Bethel is calling, and I must go. I'll sing the second stanza. Back to the beautiful path I once trod. Back to the church and the people of God. Out of the cold world of sin and its woe. Bethel is calling and I must go. Back to Bethel. I must go back where the rivers of sweet water flow. Back to the true life my soul longs to know. Bethel is calling and I must go. That's a good old hymn, amen. It's still true today. Christian, we're getting in the last days and there's all kinds of idols trying to fill your heart. Trying to take your testimony. Trying to take your mother and your children and your daughters and sons. Let's put away the strange gods. Let's get our testimony back. Let's walk back to Bethel. Let's get back to the Lord and the altar of God in a time of family prayer. Brother Joel, would you come?